Hi, I'm Portland Jones and you're watching the Pony Club Australia at Home series. I'm really excited today because I'm here talking to one of Australia's best known equestrian competitors, Heath Ryan. Heath needs very little introduction. As one of Australia's most successful producers and breeders of performance horses, Heath himself is living proof that breeding matters, coming from a family of talented and successful, successful equestrian competitors. Both his parents represented Australia in carriage driving and his brother Matt won a gold medal at the 1992 Barcelona Olympics. Heath has competed internationally and on three occasions was Australian three-day event champion and on four occasions Australian Grand Prix dressage champion. His most successful horse was the Stadion Regardé Moi, who won 40 Grand Prix dressage competitions. As well as being a talented competitor, Heath is also a highly sought after coach. Many of Australia's top riders have trained with him and give him credit for their success. He was assistant coach for the 1996 Atlanta Olympic team and the 2000 Sydney Olympic team, both of which won gold medals. He also coached the Thai Olympic team and achieved some great results. Alongside his wife, Rosie, herself a well-known and highly decorated dressage rider, Heath runs Ryan's, a busy equestrian centre aiming for elite performance. Rosie and Heath also breed performance horses and run Auction of the Stars. So welcome, Heath. Um, as most of our listeners are Pony Club members, I was wondering if we could lead off with a little bit of a, perhaps you could give us some information about your Pony Club career and how it all began. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I think, it, you know, I was um, a little bit of a, a late starter. Um, I think I was 12 years of age and then Santa Claus um, bought me my first pony and, and he came from uh, Tiny Fitzsimmons and, and Tiny Fitzsimmons uh, ran the, uh, the, the dog meat uh, horses uh, in the Maitland Hunter Valley area and his sons to this day still run that business and my dad who was a vet asked him for a very, very quiet, reliable horse. And I got Trigger for that Christmas. And um, Trigger was used by Tiny Fitzsimmons, who was a huge guy, of course, you know, the contradiction. And, and um, for Christmas parties, he'd pull Salty in amongst the kids. And, um, and then he could be ridden. And, and he was the most wonderful thing. And I, I would ride him bareback in those days in shorts and no shirt. And I had all the wrong things down the Black Hill Road, um, which is in the Hunter Valley, not too far away from Newcastle. It was a dirt road and, and um, Trigger was the most wonderful horse and, and, and he, he wouldn't stop, you know, you, you could balance on his mouth, but he had no break. He wasn't, he wasn't fast or run away, but anyway, that was my, my start. I mean, that was a terrible way to start, quite truthfully. In the, in the early, I think it must have been um, early 70s, you know, 1970, around there, I joined Maitland Pony Club, and that was when I was 12 or 13 or something. And um, and they were wonderful sort of uh, sunny days, and and I met lots of other people, and, um, and, and I, I was um, not a fancy rider. I, you know, I, I was in my element, but... Um, and I could stick on, but I, I was no great rider. But the, the other thing that Maitland Pony Club did was every year it would try to win the zone finals for the Pony Club team of four. And they might be four greys or four bays. And down they go to the Sydney Royal each year at Easter time. And that was the finale of, of finales to go in there and try and win a ribbon at Sydney Royal um, in the Pony Club teams of four. And, and so... But I, I did that, but I, I was always in the middle of that pony club team of four. That's always the, the riders you're trying to cover up. That That's where they are. So, you know, I wasn't one of the ones on the outside, which was just showing the judges how exquisitely, you know, I rode. And it was just the most wonderful time. So, you know, there's no question. That's where we started. And of course, you know, in pony club, you're told to keep your heels down. I, I can remember looking at at the instructor, you're white down, you know, and, and, and your hands together. And so it was, the, it was um, uh, definitely, you know, the last doing of the, the, the kids out of the bush and, um, and doing the, the hard work to, to get them at least safe. And, you know, you, you get introduced to helmets and, and riding boots. And, and, you know, today, I would die if someone came into my arena and have a proper helmet on and, 
and proper riding equipment, you know, and and um, and and that was just so important for for all of we boys, and of course for me, it was the start of my entire life, really. And so you ended up going on to become not only a really successful event rider, but also a very successful dressage rider, and you are competing in both sports still. It was really unusual because. I was always um, of the opinion that you don't just go to the Olympics. And I wanted to go to the Olympics, um, you know, ever since I was probably eight or nine. Um, you know, I just embarrassed my parents because I'd announced that. You, you know, you could see your parents and look at the ceiling and go, well, that's nice, honey, because you blurred it out in public, you know, in front of their <laughs> friends. And, um, and so I um, didn't play rugby league. I played rugby union. And... Um, it, it, you know, I was, um, I, I, so I was staying amateur, always stayed amateur sports, and of course that makes no difference today, but then it, it, it might have uh, in those days. And, and so I had this fascination with high performance. Now, I didn't know anything about it, and I didn't know what I was going to go to the Olympics in. Uh, my dad said, oh, Heath, you know, you're, you're pretty fast, and, and, and in the lineouts in rugby union, I could really jump high to get the ball he said you might you might go to the olympics as a pole vaulter you know and 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 yeah, we had no idea you know i'd have been the smallest pole vaulter you know in in, in world history you know? and so i look at those guys these days and i go dad what were you thinking <laughs> how could you give me such misinformation you know because i study i had a good look at these guys running down with these monstrous poles you know i'm going i could be good at that i don't know about this you know and my parents sent me off to england um this is in the late 70s um and that was to um study the the british horse society assistant instructors course and that was run by a, a guy called colonel bill frow i don't think that applying myself with everything i had that i ever did a lesson where I could honestly look back and say, I didn't waste one second. Somewhere in that lesson, I still got distracted. However, I, I think I probably improved the, the effort I was making by uh, over 100%. And my, my progress just, just bolted the, 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 the amount of progress and how much I improved in the second half. It was phenomenal. I never forgot that. Um, and... And for the rest of my life, I would I would remember that you know in in uh, in the dressage test, whenever there's a little bit of a let up, you can be working your butt off, making sure the horse is even better for the next movement. Or um, it, it, you know when you're when you're um, out warming up for the dressage test, you know you need to weigh every minute in, you know so carefully. Um, uh, every minute counts and, and it might be your grandmother watching or your best friend about you'd like to chat to but you know at, at that point in time it's a bad choice of of distractions you know and, and that so that was great in England and, and that was six month course and then I went off to um, Germany Egon von Neindorf oh my goodness um, it was very very tough and it was you know worst and Tom Fritz and and uh, so cold and, and, and snow and, and, and it was, um, uh, yeah, it wasn't that hygienic. And anyway, anyway, I survived it and it was, it was wonderful. Uh, and and I, I learned so much there and it was over Grand Prix horses we had, those school horses, um, but that was very good. And then I went off to Portugal and that was very beautiful with Nuno Oliveira and that was very light and, and soft and horses, were not um, uh, uh, stressed as hard. And the big thing about these two places, though, they were, they were high-end dressage stables. And it was my opinion, I, all the time I was um, really uh, very interested in, in eventing. And it was my opinion that if we could do really spectacular dressage or, or just get away in the lead in dressage, that that would be the approach for eventing in the future. Now, in hindsight, of course, that's where it's all gone, but not in the early days. You know, in the in the early days, um, you used to get bonus points if you finished the cross country um, under time. And so then I, I went back into England and I was show jumping in England when I returned and, and um, I met Rosie. So that was probably 
the biggest life changing thing that happened to me because then Rosie became my wife and and um, and I'm still married to Rosie now. It, for me, I, I never did go to work. I always just pursued the, the dream and, and loved it and managed to make enough money to, you know, go all over the world. And, and it's just been a very fortunate life. Yeah, fantastic. Can you tell me that apart from Trigger, what horses <laughs> are the most memorable for you? Well, um, I, at Pony Club, uh, felt that I was a, a, a jumping rider to start with. The only problem with it was that Trigger, his record at Maitland Show uh, for the Pony Club jump was I got as far as fence six before I got eliminated, three stops and you're out. So that was my career with Trigger. <laughs> in terms of show jumping i don't know why i thought i was the show jumper but i did and um and i bought uh, my dad bought this little palomino horse called peppy and he was mad just mad you just hang on to him but you point him at a fence but just just swinging off him and he'd just go he'd just jump and he gave me my first taste of clear rounds show jumping and uh, so i remember peppy peppy was cracking it was um, a massive breakthrough for me. I, I, I'd been going for years and years and years in the pony club jumping competition and never gotten round. And, and I'd watch everyone else doing it. And, you know, I thought they were pretty good. And I just didn't understand it. You know, what was, what, what was wrong with me? I couldn't get round. Um, so I, I, I certainly, uh, I owed a lot to him. And then um, dad and mum bought me a, a horse um, called Widgee War, and she was my go-to horse for years and years. And she was remarkable because um, she didn't just do pony club eventing, but she actually reached out at the end of, at the end of my sort of pony club years into the beginning of my senior years, and she completed um, a an Olympic trial at, at it was used to be at Melbourne Hunt Club and and like I had no idea what I was doing when I look back it was it was ghastly you know what I would ask this Miss Mayor Widgie War to do my my most um spectacular um partner was Ricardo Moir who in the dressage world who um he, he took me to um I think three um, national Grand Prix Australian titles wins in Grand Prix. He was um, he won more Grand Prix than any other horse in Australia. Uh, period, not just stallions. Um, he, he was um, a fabulous horse, a, a, just a fabulous horse. We are almost sadly out of time, um, but I just have one last question for you. If you had any advice for an up and coming pony club rider. What would it be? You really do need to um, hold on to your dreams. Um, and, and, and I have special um, empathy with people that just blurt out they'd like to go to the Olympics, uh, even if it embarrasses your parents. I, I do think you need to think your way through it. You, you know, you've got to have a plan. You, 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 you have to plan things. You um, have to understand that um, going to the Olympics is something unusual. So um, you're not going to do quite what everyone tells you to do. You're not, because otherwise you'll end up like everyone else. Uh, you, you know, it's, it's going to be a pathway that is um, a, a, a marked by you being a little um, uh, determined determined and the problem with being really determined is sometimes it makes you inflexible you, you really don't want to be inflexible you've got to be able to change your mind but determined 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 and just never give up it's it's as simple as that just it, it, and 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 i guess the the key then the dirty key to the whole thing is hard work but determined never give up hard work and and you can do anything yeah it's good life advice, not just for horse riders. 
Heath Ryan, thank you so much for giving us some of your valuable time. I know you are just like the busiest man <laughs> in the Hunter Valley and I really appreciate it. And I'm sure the Pony Club kids are going to enjoy every minute of that. Um, I certainly know that I did. So thank you very much. And um, you. that was wonderful. Very much.